to introduce our center to uh, students here at Stanford Law School and outside Stanford Law School to tell them about the work we do here and uh, get you involved in the exciting work we do. So Codex is a uh, joint center between the Stanford Law School and the Computer Science Department. We were started over 10 years ago at this point. So um, pretty long uh, history here. Our motto is legal empowerment through information technology. Uh, we research and develop technologies that make the legal system more efficient for all stakeholders in the legal system. We are a research center here at Stanford, uh, but we are also a community of early stage legal tech innovators. So um, many of the folks who were you know, students or, or uh, affiliated as fellows in our center, they, um, they started their own legal techs. So um, either you know, out of the research that, um, that we developed at, uh, uh, within Codex, um, that you know had where we saw an opportunity to bring it in the marketplace you know those fellows they ran with it and created uh, a legal tech startup sometimes we have people who come with a with a developed idea already for legal tech and they become affiliated as an entrepreneurial fellows of our center so just a few words about and but we have a, a number of uh, our fellows here and I think the best way to learn about what uh, kind of uh, work codex is involved in is, um, is for you to hear from our fellows. Okay, so uh, I said Codex is um, a name, is you know, uh, the Center for Legal Informatics. Uh, we are particularly focused on the branch of computational law, which is the branch that concerns itself with the mechanization and automation of legal analysis. Okay, so just a few words generally about le uh, legal innovation, or legal tech innovation. This is, you know, some of you have, uh, have seen this slide before. This is my very simplified uh, history of important technological innovations uh, in, in legal technology. Uh, I kind of like to start with a, a West American digest system, which was uh, invented around 1900. We could, of course, you know, go even further back in, into the past to the Codex Hammurabi, which was a, you know, which a profound, you know, a, a technical innovation of profound importance in in basically memorizing the uh, the law, uh, but in more his recent history, you know, I would start with uh, West American Digest system as a as an invention that allowed us to access the uh, case law uh, in a more organized way. Then, uh, in uh, actually in the uh, late fifties, the pioneers in AI already started thinking about how artificial intelligence can be applied to the legal domain. Um, but in sort of this became a more serious effort in the late 60s, 1970s, when we started to have the first electronic uh, research uh, systems. Then soon thereafter, uh, legal expert systems became a thing. In the 90s, uh, e-discovery, and around the 2000s, legal process outsourcing, you know, attorney networks, multi-sided platforms, uh, alternative legal service providers started to you know, become... Uh, uh, you know, uh, you know, kind of an inno important innovation around 10 years ago. About the same time, you know, we heard this, this this thing, you know, big data law for the first time, and now all the way up to you know computational law, computable contracts, you know, the blockchain, which are sort of you know the new kind of focus areas of you know the uh, legal innovation community, um, and. Um, you know, AI is, you know, uh, everybody's talking about AI and how it's, you know, potentially disrupting the legal profession as we know it. Um, of course, AI is not just one thing. There are many different approaches. Uh, the most basic, uh, different, you know, difference that you should be aware of is, you know, there's these so-called rules-driven approaches and uh, data-driven approaches. Where the rules-driven approaches, they use the methods of logic programming, deductive approaches uh, in AI to do things like you know, legal expert systems, legal chatbots, computable contracts. Uh, and the data-driven approaches use the statistical AI methods, natural language processing, machine learning, neural networks, to do things like so inductive approaches of, of AI, to do things like data analytics, predictive analytics, uh, e-discovery, contracts analytics, those kinds of things. And it's the latter ones that, you know, from a, from a, from attorneys, a traditional attorney's point of view, 
seem somewhat more uh, more threatening uh, as they typically view you know so the ability to be able to predict legal outcomes as something that's associated with their own experience as lawyers and that machines won't be able to do so anyway so AI disruption a few years ago has been like all over the media now I feel like it has been sort of a little bit uh, dehyped but this concept of the Robo lawyer was you know much much written about uh, there's been also some writings about you know how law schools would be disrupted through the digital transformation and uh, yeah so disruption was was a big theme uh, it's it's somewhat uh, fading a little bit. I think we're, that doesn't mean that that uh, the legal profession, as we knew it, won't be disrupted. But at least you know, we're I think we're thinking more about how these systems can be used as kind of lawyer enhancing systems, and you know how you know some more incremental change uh, is actually coming to the profession, and um, and you know legal professionals are thinking about how to leverage that. In their in their own own practice, all right. So legal tech entrepreneurship is a is a big thing, and it's a big thing for Codex too. We have lots of very entrepreneurial fo folks involved in Codex. Um, we are tracking uh, uh, legal tech companies. Uh, uh, Peter Gunst here is one of our fellows. He he uh, created this uh, database a couple of years ago with uh, with uh, with students. Uh, that tracks um, legal tech uh, companies. You see, like, sort of the high mark was around two, uh, 2015 in terms of like new legal tech companies that were founded. Um, we've also, in recent years, seen somewhat of an increased uh, interest in investing in, in this space in legal tech. Legal tech had traditionally been somewhat of a, of a, a, a fringe category from a venture capitalist uh, perspective, but now we've We've seen more and more marquee VC funds invest in legal tech, invest uh, significant amounts in, in legal tech. Um, so Clio, I think, just raised $250 million. Atrium, $65 million from Andreessen Horowitz. Ironclad, Kira, and so on. We've also seen an increase in uh, uh, acquisitions. So. Um, Ernst & Young recently bought a, a, a very well-known legal tech company from, from Thomson Reuters, uh, Pangea 3. Avo was acquired by internet brands. Uh, Elevate acquired LexPredict. And so there's been a lot of acquisitions and in, uh, increased uh, M&A activity. And we had the first IPO, I think, in legal tech. So, uh, so DocuSign... Uh, went public uh, earlier this year. They uh, had a very successful IPO, which is, you know, kind of, uh, is, is kind of a, uh, you know, given the uh, the current landscape, is kind of uh, surprising. And uh, what's interesting is they also their, their market cap is uh, almost ten, uh, sorry, almost eleven billion dollars, which I think is quite remarkable if you think, if you see that Thomson Reuters uh, market cap is about uh, 33 billion dollars, and Mark, uh, Thomson Reuters is the big kind of uh, behemoth uh, player in the space. All right, so so let's talk just a few words about legal tech education. So about eight years ago, Larry Ripstein, who unfortunately passed away a few years ago, but he already said um, in an article, a 2011 article. We talked about the future of legal education, and he said, in general, this legal information market creates a new task for legal educators. Instead of just learning uh, how to counsel individuals on their co context-specific and idiosyncratic problems, legal experts need to be able to use legal information to design products for general use for trading capital assets. And so that's something that I think we live and breathe at, at Codex, uh, and I think that's very very accurate statement. We see a lot of, um, so we started over 10 years ago, and in recent years, other law schools have sort of started to take an interest in legal innovation, legal technology too. So there's a lot of experimentation going on. Uh, we certainly at Codex believe that every lawyer has to know at least the basics of legal informatics. Uh, so we offer a number of different courses to teach students. We have a, our sort of, um, flagship course is our legal informatics class that we'll offer again in the spring next year. Um, and then we had ex experimented with a bunch of 
uh, pop-up classes that, that show to be very, um, very popular with our students. So uh, uh, Jay uh, and our former uh, residential fellow, Jameson uh, Dempsey, uh, were working on, uh, uh, put together this very uh, interesting class on exponential innovations, AI and law boot camp. Um, and Jay will tell us a little bit more about that in just a bit. We had a, a pop-up class on legal entrepreneurship. We also had a startup boot camp. Uh, for ethical and sustainable development. So, so we're experimenting with a lot of kind of uh, course uh, formats. And, um, and so that's been, I think, a great way for our students to, to get involved and learn more. And many of our students, I think, you know, develop interesting ideas that they actually decided to carry forward. And uh, OK, so then uh, we have a big uh, conference every year. Sorry. All right, that's our Codex Future Law Conference, which happens every April. It brings together the legal innovation community. Uh, and I hope you will also participate in this conference. It's a very, very important event for us. Um, we have a monthly speaker series where we bring in people who do interesting things uh, on the forefront of, of, of legal tech. Um, and then uh, we have uh, our smallest format is our weekly group meeting. So every Thursday, we meet uh, and bring the group together. Sometimes it's you know sort of 15 people. We also have an online audience, you know, discussing new legal tech, um, entrepreneurial ideas or research papers. So that's uh, that's sort of like you know it's kind of ground zero. It's a it's a it's the easiest way for for students to get involved and and uh, and learn about the space. All right. So if you wanna. If you want to know who's coming uh, at those meeting to those meetings, just sign up for our uh, for our um, uh, Codex group meetings list. So, so with that, that's my very brief overview. And so we have, I think, four more presentations. And uh, while uh, next is going to be St Stephen Keynes. Uh, Stephen is our is our uh, current residential uh, Codex fellow. Stephen, why don't you come up and uh, uh, pull up your presentation? And, uh, and while Stephen's getting, getting set up, are there any, any questions at this point? Any? No, all clear? Don't be shy. Well, I have a yeah. question. Go ahead. Uh, if there is somebody from the, is there somebody from the blockchain group here? Yes. yes. We will talk about the blockchain. Yes, uh, Mike's here, yeah. We'll talk about blockchain, I think, yeah. But you have a question. Anyone can go to our weekly meetings. Uh, of course, you know, super free to email and talk about it. And also, not just to, I mean, obviously to listen in, but also if you have a new idea and you want to find some like minded people who can sort of help you think through it and maybe team up with you, that's a good place to be. Be sure to sign up for the mailing list to get the latest information. Okay. All right. So over to you, Stephen. Thank you so much, Roland. I'm really excited to be here. My name is Stephen Keynes, and I am the new residential fellow for Codex. I'm still relatively new to Stanford. I've been here for just over a month, so my proposal is kind of in its early stages. Uh, just a little bit more about me. I, were, I was previously at the University of Miami, where I focus on legal technology, specifically for the public sector, nonprofits, and legal aids. So I worked at the Legal Services of Greater Miami. Uh, I've always been fascinated by issues of digital privacy, and my proposal and my research is focusing on the domestic use of facial recognition by public and law enforcement agencies in the United States. So just a little roadmap. I'm going to talk about what is facial recognition, where is it currently being used, why should we be concerned, and what is my proposed solution, and also potential challenges we might face in doing so. So just to define facial recognition, it is the automated process of comparing two images of faces to determine whether they represent the same individual. And facial recognition algorithms have been around since the 90s but they're relatively picking up steam and also increasing in use throughout the world. Uh, so typically, all facial recognition systems follow, for, follow this pipeline of four steps. So you input an image. First, it detects whether there's a face in the image, and they do that by detecting eyes and nose and other things. Then you have alignment, so that might uh, take cropping or just changing the orientation if it's a video, so you can get a regular profile of the face. And then three, you have feature extraction. So essentially, you quantitatively extract those features. So it might be the distance between the pupils of the eyes, the length of the jawline, and different features. And you transfer that into a quantitative measurement. And then you compare that to known samples in your database. And then that's where you get the recognition aspect. 
In a very broad sense, uh, these are computer vision algorithms. The most common, it, common is a convolutional neural network. And typically, they're built by third party vendors that are later licensed to different government agencies. So this is a map from an organization called Fighting for the Future. And they essentially document and track different changes in facial recognition across the country. And so what I love about this specific map is that they not only have organizations, but they also have things like stadiums and airports and different um, entities that are using facial recognition. So just some quick numbers so we can get a scope of the problem. Um, the FBI, and this is from a 2017 Georgetown paper called The Perpetual Lineup, which is a great paper that details the use of facial recognition. Um, about 117 million Americans are already in a facial recognition database. And an Electric Frontier Foundation or paper rather states that the FBI facilitates this for 23,000 law enforcement agencies, both domestic and foreign. And also, in 2017, the FBI was averaging about 7,000 searches per month. In terms of states regulating this, what's interesting is there's a question of where the photos come from. So the FBI has a criminal repository, which is taken from mugshots, um, criminal investigations, and they also have a civil repository, which comes from licensure's photos. So your barber, your lawyer, every time you need to send in your face for a background check, it's probably in a civil repository. And they started combining these two into what's known as a single identity profile in 2015. And a lot of states actually let law enforcement use uh, their DMV databases to, for source photos. And what's interesting is some states explicitly allow them. Other states are prohibiting this practice. So 21 states in DC allow the FBI to scan, to scan their database. States like Maine, Vermont, Missouri, and New Hampshire have blanket bans on using biometric data from their DMVs. So it's interesting to see how states are handling this issue. Most recently, uh, California Bill 1215 just passed. And that essentially prohibits law enforcement from integrating facial recognition with police body cameras. And what's interesting about this is with facial recognition, you can divide it into passive surveillance and also real time. So passive is typically after a criminal incident has happened. Real time would be if an officer is wearing a body camera and they're trying to identify someone in the moment. And what's interesting is real time is notoriously less reliable. And also you have issues where if officers are making decisions off information that may not be accurate, it may lead to certain negative consequences. So also some hotspots city-wise are Las Vegas, New York, Detroit, and Chicago. Cities with blanket bans on public agencies using them are Oakland, San Francisco, Berkeley, which was just added recently, and Somerville, Massachusetts. So why do we really care about facial recognition? Why is this actually an issue? So the first is bias and error rates. Uh, there are significantly higher error rates for number one, um, people that are very young and very old. This is partly because face changes often as you age very rapidly. Secondly, between men and women, women have a higher amount of error rates. One of the most interesting reasons or justifications for this um, that I read is a proposed, it's because of cosmetics that change from faces and it may be affecting the algorithm. Three, also race, so darker skinned individuals have a higher rate of error rates when used as further photos. Two, invasion of privacy. Uh, the, the paper of the Georgetown is titled Perpetual Lineup because you're essentially comparing a face to an ongoing database and there's a lot of privacy concerns. And also there's an instance of the chilling effect that you might experience within this in the sense of when police monitor protests, they often record them now. And it's kind of creating this film now, potentially prosecute later, or they can even pull out people from the crowd that may have active warrants. So this type of activity might actually prevent people from participating in protected speech in the near future and exercising First Amendment rights. Uh, three, integration with other technology. I mentioned body cameras. Drone usage is also another major concern. Uh, lack of informed consent. So if they're using DMV photos, how many of us were told when we got a driver's license from the state of California that that photo might be used for against us in a criminal prosecution? There's an issue also with um, ICE, where they're trying to use facial recognition on police databases for states that grant driver's license to undocumented persons. So that's another issue of informed consent of where these photos are coming from and how they're being used. Data security and immutability. It's very hard to change your face. You can only do that typically through surgery or taking mass amounts of hormones. So there's an issue that, unlike a social security number, where if it gets lost, they can issue another one, you can't necessarily do that with your face. So there's issues with that. And if you combine that with deep fakes, there's a worry that you might be able to doctor photos and then essentially frame some for a crime, which is a very interesting proposition. Uh, increased risk of marginalization. So minorities are more likely to be in police databases due to over-policing. And so there's a worry that you might exacerbate the problem, very similar to when we use predictive technologies for police. They tend to sometimes indicate areas that are already over police and kind of perpetuate a cycle. And finally, little to no oversight or transparency. If you look at things like government accountability reports and privacy impact assessments, um, a lot of states and public agencies are not exactly clear with their use policies or being very transparent. So that's a major concern. So what is my solution to all these issues? 
the lack of standardized protocol suggests to me that there should be someone, like an entity, that comes together and creates a protocol. So it operates on four levels. And the first would be for judges, litigators, and lawmakers, giving them a framework to understand these technologies. Introduction to things like, what is a confidence interval? How do I distinguish between two potential providers of facial recognition technology? And just kind of giving them different modes of evaluation. Second, for community members, I do feel that there are certain jurisdictions that are giving their community members proper notice and trying to do a notice and comment type proceeding. But if community members don't have knowledge of the technology or its potential impacts, they can't participate in the discussion. So I'd also like to provide a list of resources, advocacy groups, and tools that they can use in deciding if this is something that's right for their community. Three, for public and law enforcement agencies, a sample public use policy. So they can under things about minimum hardware requirements. So anybody that has a little thing about photography knows that things like f-stop lenses might change the dimensions of your face. And so a standardization for even something as simple as the, of the type of cameras used by, um, but used by uh, these agencies would be very helpful. Minimum pixel requirements for the input photos would also be helpful in creating standardization. And then finally, for the engineers, the ethical creation of data sets is a very interesting issue as to where these photos come from. Most recently, uh, Google was actually slammed in the internet or slammed in media because they were giving people, homeless people specifically, $5 gift cards to scan their faces. And there's questions of the ethics of that, of that system. And so I recognize that this is a very ambitious project. So let's go over some of the, the potential challenges that I might face in doing some of these, in enacting these protocol, rather. So first, there are suggestions that I make if we're starting from ground up, but we need to recognize that these systems are in use today, and you can't start over, so you need to work within the systems that are already existing. Two, structuring a proposed deployment scale. So when I say that, I mean, I don't think it's controversial to say that we should not use it for petty theft at this time because of the risk of error rates. However, it may be useful in instances of national security or terrorism. However, everything else in between. So for instance, strong arm robbery can easily be defined as someone plucking your phone from your hand if you're at a bus stop. Should it be used for that? Personally, I feel no, but I recognize that that is my own personal philosophical assessment of what is serious crime, and that's different for everybody. So defining everything else in between that spectrum is going to be difficult. Three, for defining and differentiating the computer vision algorithms, um, I recognize my technical expertise within that aspect is not as high as my policy skills in that sense, so I recognize that that's going to be difficult. Also, a lot of these vendors have non-disclosure agreements with the public agencies, so there are things that are preventing um, the public from kind of understanding and differentiating how these technologies are working. Uh, the due process arguments. Uh, in the criminal law, a lot of people are using, trying to use Brady evidence as a way to get this evidence in, or even just see what other candidates were brought up when their client's photo was used. And that's often blocked, again, by the NDA issues. Um, the nature of these algorithms, that each one is different and unique, has different parameters, is going to be difficult to also create standardization, ensuring compliance as well. Um, and there's tailoring messages for a different audience. And also the public perception. One interesting thing I recently read was a Pew Research study that said the majority of Americans do not have an issue with facial recognition being used by law enforcement, whereas they do have issues with facial recognition being used by private companies. And what I find interesting by that is that it means one of two things to me personally, either that I'm viewing this issue as something more serious as it is, or the public may not be as educated to the uh, nuances and potential dangers of this technology. So like I mentioned, I'm very early on in this presentation, in this research rather. I welcome any and all comments and critiques. And that is my idea. I'm OK, great. Thank you. <laughs> all right, so next up, uh, uh, Leila, you want to go? Yes. OK. And uh, OK, so while Leila is setting up, uh, any, any questions for Steven on his research? Yes, Bruce. Uh, That's a great question. So I've been trying to consider how do judges learn, how do they integrate new information. In this age of social media, they've had to learn a plethora of things that they never had maybe when they were in their 20s. And there are different modes of educating judges, like things like COEs and other aspects and seminars of that nature. So that's one thing that I will delve into as well as to how to educate judges, how to frame it in a very compact, like succinct message and be able to kind of educate them as well. So I'm going to look at other programs of how judges have kind of introduced new knowledge into their realm of expertise. So as 
of society and procedurally, we've decided that if you're arrested for a crime, it is okay for the police to take pictures of your face, take your fingerprints, and do a bunch of other things within the booking procedures, and even in some circumstances, take DNA from you. The issue that I find specifically with facial recognition as it applies to DMV is that those photos were never originally meant for that purpose. They were meant for the government to ID you when you're operating a motor vehicle and also verify that you don't already have an existing photo. So my issue is that there are a lot of procedural guards that protect the government from kind of overreaching and gaining access to information that they don't have without a warrant. And a lot of this use of databases and DMV data is not coming with any judicial approval. It's not coming with any kind of you know, preconceived notions of like justice in that sense. So a lot of the issues just come from the fact of what was the original intention of the photos. And so also in the concept of body cameras, another issue people have is the reason why we have body cameras is to increase public trust in police. To turn that, not, that device now into a surveillance issue, into a surveillance device, which generates more information for the police, goes against its original purpose. Not so much of what was the purpose that the photos were. All right, thank you, Steve. Thank you. All right, uh, Leila. Hey, everyone. My name is Leila Benny Jamali. I'm one of the co founders of a company called Symbium. I'm also a proud Codex fellow. Uh, and the CEO of Symbium. Here's uh, one of the products that we have launched, publicly available. Uh, you can see this at build.symbium.com. Anyone can use it and access it. So, uh, all right, what do we do? First of all, uh, the team was formed here at Stanford, um, at Codex and the CS department. And uh, we are the computational law company. We call ourselves that's so our tagline. Uh, and what computational law is, I think everyone here has at least heard of computational law. Uh, but how we define it is uh, this idea that we're mechanizing these laws and we're giving people a new way to interact with planning laws and regulations today. And in the future, we have other uh, ideas for that. But a comp law system that you know, takes laws and regulations and basically brings them directly to you so that you can experience them in a new way rather than manually reading the law treatises and looking them up online that you're very familiar with is TurboTax. And that's the example we like to use. So TurboTax taking the IRS tax code and mechanizing it, basically building it into a web application. So as you type, you get instant feedback on your tax obligations. We have a system that we built, a platform that we built, that enables us to do this in a very, very lightweight manner. So it might have taken the TurboTax folks at Intuit you know, six months to a year to build all of TurboTax. We could build it uh, maybe in a matter of days using this platform and without writing a single line of traditional code. So we have this amazing platform. Where do we launch? Well, we decided to launch it in actually the hardest and largest industry on the planet, which is government. And within government, the planning space, because it's the core of every city's activities. And so I'm going to show you right now one of the really cool web applications that we built. And it's a portal. We call it Build. So here it is, and we're going to uh, basically learn what it enables us to do today is learn uh, whether we can build what's called an accessory dwelling unit on any particular parcel. We've covered a number of different cities that you can see here. What is an accessory dwelling unit? It's just a second unit. So imagine you have a single family home and you want to build a second unit on that property. It could be inside the garage as long as it has a separate entrance. It could be somewhere you know in the back where the shed was. So it gives people the idea, uh, idea of you know, whether I can build it. And then more interestingly, and this is where the computational law component comes into place, is all of the development standards that would then apply. How big can this be? Where exactly can it be located? And all of the things that you would need to know, you know in order to do this and that you would traditionally go to a planning counter, take a number, or talk to an architect to find out, can I do this? And what are the details? So let's just see it visually. So we're going to. Type in an address here for a property in a Redwood City. 20 grand. OK. So we've activated Redwood City. We've basically taken the ADU regulations for uh, in the planning code and a number of other laws and regulations related to ADUs. And we've built them right into this. And so it asks us, is this the location of my project? Uh, yes, yeah, so it actually pulls out, let's go back for a second. It's going to pull it, uh, immediately pull all this interesting data. This is you know, pretty straightforward. It's no real comp law tech yet. But we get to see stuff that you might find in the tax records or some other places, like the size of your lot and that sort of thing, whether there's a primary residence. So let's just go to the next screen. Is there a single family home? So if I click on no, 
it's going to tell me that an ADU is not allowed here, and it'll tell me why, because an ADU is allowed on residential property only and what types of residential property. So let's click on yes, and it'll say an ADU may be allowed at this location, which is interesting. So, uh, okay, let's click on next to get to the development standards. Now here's where it gets really, really exciting. So uh, there's three types of ADUs that are possible here in Redwood City, an attached, a detached, or an ADU located within an existing structure. We kind of have some visuals here for help. Let's go with the detached ADU for purpose of this demo. It immediately tells us, and this is where you have your first sort of instance of, of computational law uh, being displayed. It's taking the laws and regulations, it's applying analysis to them as uh, relevant to this particular address, which is very significant. So now. Based on this address, it's telling me that the maximum height for my new unit can be 14 feet. If I check that the ADU is going to be built over a garage, let's say a garage attic, it's instantly telling me that it can now be 20 feet high. It's giving me all the information about the maximum new square footage. Uh, there's some information about minimum setbacks. If I don't know what a setback is, I can click on that to get some visuals and an idea of what that is. OK, so I understand what that is now. So let's view the setback on the map. So a setback is basically the parts of the property where you can actually build something on it. And we've highlighted that in green for you. OK, so, <clears throat> so now from here, I'm going to actually do something really cool, show you the map in larger format. And we're going to start drawing on it. So now I want to draw my accessory dwelling unit on my property. Let's go ahead and draw a building. It's a pretty traditional footprint here, maybe somewhat of a square. Instant feedback that it satisfies the rear yard coverage requirements. It does not exceed the maximum footprint size. Really helpful to know that. And here I've drawn my ADU right on the property. Let's do something different. Let's actually uh, change the style of the ADU. So we're going to actually change. OK, so it's, now it's going to be an odd shape here. We have our master architect over there developing our property. Oh, that's very interesting, Abhijit. Thank you. All right, great, wonderful. And it's red. Why is it red? It says it's because it's within six feet of another building. It's instantly analyzed the law to say that this property, in the way that we've designed it, is not allowed. OK, so now let's move it and see what happens. Perfect. It's green. Green means go, satisfied setback. Right distance, right size, doesn't exceed the maximum coverage. Great. So we're actually, uh, uh, and you know, if we take it outside the lot lines, of course, it's going to you know, continue to give us feedback. So imagine a system where you basically are taking your building footprints and you're dropping them right onto the property. And that's our, one of the things that we're working on right now is with developers taking their building footprints and actually really detailed map plans, site plans, and basically allowing people to drop it right on their site, move it around, make changes. We're going to do some analysis on those plans, so very exciting stuff. So let's continue here. And we're going to, we can actually do a measurement of the property too. So if you want to do measurement, uh, get dimensions, yep. So we can get the dimensions instantly of all of our buildings. Um, our system is, is configured in a way where we can handle uh, lots and pre existing structures of unusual shapes and still apply the same calculations. It's a very difficult thing to do. Uh, OK, I think that's good. Let's close this for now. All right, so we know what it can be. We know where it can be located on the property. It's going to give us some additional requirements you know, that we may want to know. Parking is not required for ADUs. It can be rented. There's fire sprinkler requirements. So multiple departments uh, would have different requirements for your development project. We could list them here. We could actually build out more apps for those. So we're building in a very modular way where we can have those plugged in as well. We'll do that over time. Let's click on Next. So now we're dropped into the process information. Of course, the next step is to actually drop people right into the process of applying for those permits, filling out forms, or getting smart permits and that sort of thing in place. So here today, what we have is uh, just general information, who to get started, about designing your ADU, applying for the permits. You may require some tree removal, construction on the second floor, and just links directly to the permits. <clears throat> and then once you're satisfied, you can print your report. You can take it with you to the planning department. You could give it to your uh, developer or your architect. It has all of the information that you generated on your own that would normally take you know, maybe several you know, 
I don't know, 100 hours of time in order to compile this information. And certainly, if you're analyzing different parcels, it takes a long time to learn what you can do on each one. But here, you can do it instantly. All right, so let's close that. Uh, so that's what we have right now. Uh, in the future, we're going to obviously expand this into multiple modules. You know, we have other ideas about other verticals that we want to enter, not just planning government. And, and the same idea applies there. So building it in a very, very lightweight manner. By the way, these are thousands of pages of regulations that we did this in a matter of weeks. So that's it. Cool. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah. All right. So, so we feel at, at Codex that um, this is really the future of computational law. It's like you know, giving systems into the organizations and institutions that uh, produce law and help them make those laws access, more accessible uh, to the people who are actually the subjects of those laws. So, uh, so I think Symbium is really the, the paragon of that, of that movement, um, and we're very excited about it. All right, so, so next up is, uh, is Mike, who will tell us about the work of our, of our uh, blockchain group. Great. And so let me... Do this? Are there yeah. any, any questions for, for later? Oh, this legal I.O. Peter, you want to go? Peter can go. Uh, it must be blockchain up above the next one. So uh, the question was, yeah. what's the underlying okay. technology that enables us to build these things so quickly? Uh, I'll yeah. hand it over to my CTO. <laughs> yeah. don't, don't tell them anything. <laughs> Perfect. <laughs> Cool. Over to you, Mike. Okay. Hi, I'm Michael Schmitz. I'm a Codex Fellow and also a CEO and co-founder of Blue Vista, but that's for another topic, another time. Uh, what I wanted to share, and it, we'll keep it brief, but we have a group at Codex focusing on blockchain, blockchain writ large. But frankly, uh, what we're looking at, as many of you know, there's been a huge amount of hype and a lot of, of real... Uh, backing up the, the potential blockchain. But for us, we feel like it's critically important to have kind of cut through, uh, I won't, sorry, just basically cut through sig and have more signal than noise. I was thinking of the Twitter, uh, uh, the Twitter, all sorts of the debates going on, whatever else. We feel that it's critical to look at what's real, what's not, and what the potential is. So what, what, what happened is Stanford Law uh, was able to come together with, well, it was, it was Tony Lai in particular, uh, that, that said, let's come and look at what are the most uh, important issues in the regulatory framework and look at the leading technologists that are, that are offering these things and then look at like, how we can have conversations and how we can bring those, those people together. So essentially looking at the mandate of uh, pers uh, publishing perspectives on this, so, for instance, uh, the Journal of Blockchain Law and Policy, the world's first and leading uh, uh, journal the, to offer these, uh, both from, from academic perspective and others, uh, to look at how to track, guide, and influence policy in the regulatory space, and then how to have a neutral form, because we found that the most important thing that's going on right now is a lack of conversation, the lack of discussion. And as I referenced earlier, the this is a uh, severe impediment to the development of a, of a framework that can have these technologies really um, move forward. As, as many of you know, we're having a, a huge debate around Libra, and it's getting tied to the perception, real and otherwise, of Facebook and their policies. Uh, but it's really having a huge impact on whether these new technologies are able to roll out. So we're looking at legal issues and opportunities uh, and how those uh, regulators will interact with these new technologies and the technologists. Particularly, we're looking at governance frameworks because, frankly, we think that 
there's a real world governance that should be applied and vice versa. And then we're also looking at the advent of smart contracts came out with first with Ethereum and then you're looking at like how these smart contracts code as law is able to be actually um, both implementing new innovations but also looking to protect investors and consumers. Uh, and so in that, in that context, like I said, we have the Journal of uh, Blockchain Law and Policy. Uh, again, this is something that comes out. We've already had the second, um, the second issue. Two issues come out in print. It's ongoing. Uh, the comments and essays that come out are ongoing. Uh, we encourage folks who are interested in a whole range of issues to be able to submit uh, for this. Um, we have just started a group, and we're soon going to be launching online the uh, Reg Tracks Initiative, which is the goal is to have a conversation around regulatory, uh, the regulatory framework. Uh, right now, it's either undefined Wild West or, or a kind of a reactive regulatory framework that's, that characterizes the global, the global context. Uh, we feel that it's critical to have open, engaged discussions uh, that connects regulator, uh, the regulators, not just here, across the globe, with leading technologists, with academics, and that putting those folks in a room in some way, whether it's virtually in a room or through, the, through a process of, of, uh, of different ways that we're gonna look into this, that that's, we can cons construct uh, dialogues that will lead to something that's, we don't know what it's gonna be, but it'll actually be a discussion versus a Twitter war. Um, and then, you know, essentially we're trying to get a lot of interest and go beyond the hype and have more signal than noise. So, you know, we have monthly meetings. They're open to anybody. Uh, we encourage folks to join here in person or um, via Zoom. Uh, the information can, you know, basically share wide, share with whoever you want to. Come join, uh, meet folks, uh, offer your opinions, uh, get involved with projects. Uh, we're looking to be able to continue to partner, engage in other forums. Uh, we have folks that go all around the world and present and engage, uh, like Tony and Stephen Nam, who are not here today. But uh, these, these information, you can get a hold of Tony Cush, Stephen Nam, who's the, the blockchain journal editor, myself, who's working on the Reg Tracks forum, any of those, and Bruce, who's right here, uh, that all have different uh, fires, um, irons in the fire and are able to engage directly or through, th through others in the group. Uh, and I would just encourage you to go online, look to these sites, reach out to us, but, but if you have an interest of it, we, we feel like Stanford has an opportunity to be a neutral forum that brings together folks from around the world in a way that's rare and frankly, uh, greatly needed. So that's, that's it for that. And, Questions. I will take questions, but otherwise, please know that is an ongoing uh, group. Right. Yeah. Great. Thank you. Okay. Any questions for Mike? Bruce. Yeah. That's true. And we don't, it's not just call your lawyer, although we do advise folks you should actually consider uh, the law because it's real and everyone in every jurisdiction is finding out it's very real. So, yeah. But the journal, for example, presents a case where regulators can say, we don't know what to do with the following hypothetical, or entrepreneurs can say, this is how we'd like to approach this following hypothetical, and, and hear various reactions to that rather than. Thank you.
Yeah, thank you, Mark. Thank you, Bruce. So yeah, we're very excited about uh, blockchain. Bruce has been a very active effort in, in Codex. Uh, super proud of our uh, blockchain journal. Uh, this is a great place for you all to publish in. So if you're interested in sharing any of these issues, and yeah, so that's a, that's a great, uh, really exciting part of what we do in Codex. Next up is going to be Jay Mandel. Uh, Jay has been involved with uh, Cello for several years. He's seen. Uh, he's worked as a as a big law lawyer, as an in-house uh, uh, lawyer at uh, Apple, legal tech entrepreneur, now uh, business leader working for a uh, big Fortune 500 company. And he's been very actively so giving back to the Codex community by really uh, you know, teaching very unique uh, classes for our students. And so, so without further ado, over to you, Jeff. Thanks for the kind intro. Um, how many of you are law students here right now? OK. Any students from any other schools, engineering, business? Oh, good. Oh, great. Which, which schools? Oh, great. Which school? Oh, great. Welcome to Stanford. And where are you? OK, excellent. Great. So um, it's great. So I, it's great to get a survey of, of having the tent widen to not only computer, to law students, but to computer science students. and liberal arts students, because I think this forum at uh, Codex, we want to make sure we expand our curriculum to attract folks in an inter interdisciplinary fashion. And that's kind of what we teach at, uh, at Codex as well. I'm going to talk about exponential innovations, AI, and law boot camp. And so Roland and I had a discussion about five years ago. I was very passionate about the idea of disrupting legal education, because I thought that we aren't really preparing students for 21st century lawyering. And so how do we do that? And so. The problems that uh, we came across um, were the areas that, when you think about how we teach law students, and this is a lot of you will, will uh, nod your heads if you're law students, we teach you the, the fundamentals. We teach you how outdated subject matter, property, contracts, but we teach it to you in the same way we did a decade ago, in fact, decades ago, and some of the same content. When it comes to um, the idea of teaching interdisciplinary sort of uh, areas, like business, like just the fundamentals of finance and accounting, you need to basically run a practice, or even product management or design thinking, which some of your clients are using to develop some of the most innovative products at Apple or, or at SAP or other companies. You're not learning that. Computer science, how you're developing products as a computer scientist, you don't know that, so you can't represent them as well as you would like to or represent them in-house. And then the last thing is, we're also not giving you the critical thinking skills to understand these technologies. Blockchain was amazing technology. We don't teach that in law school. Or the areas of, let's say, AI, or areas of IoT, aut autonomous sort of driving. These areas are, are cutting edge technologies in all places. We're at Stanford. We're at the epicenter of these amazing technologies. So why shouldn't we be teaching it right here? And so the, the fundamental truth that, you know, in conversations with Roland, we said, hey, we're not graduating our lawyers to be equipped to immediately help their clients. And so these are some of the solutions we came up with. And this is the genesis of some of the amazing courses that, um, that Roland and Professor Jenneres teach, and also some of the other amazing um, fellows here at Stanford at Codex. We thought we should be teaching interdisciplinary sort of teaching, teaching concepts in CS and engineering, business, product, ideas like design thinking, product management, um, understanding how um, we should be coding some of the things that we do in some of, uh, of Roland's classes to understand what it really takes to uh, build amazing products, to really represent your clients in a, in a better fashion. Um, and also not only bring um, students who are law students in our classes, but also bring students like the ones who are here as well in, in areas like business and computer science so they understand their thinking in the classroom. And then the idea of experiential education that in law school, generally speaking, we hear and understand the concepts, and we never apply them. And so in our classes, we try to teach not only the concept of design thinking or product management, but we also ask you to apply them and create businesses in our classes. And then the other areas acquire specific uh, knowledge and areas. So again, we have the uh, great fortune of having some of the foremost experts in the fields of AI, um, and some of them teach in some of our classes. In the areas of computational law, Roland and Professor Genesrith are some of the foremost experts in the areas of computational law. Um, we have experts in other fields that we draw from to teach in our classes so that you get that experience in some of the Codex classes we teach. And so an example of this is actually 
um, the Exponential Innovations AI and Law class. We mentioned a few other classes we've taught. I've had the chance to work with some great um, fellows here, um, Susan Salkind, uh, Jameson Dempsey, Dan Linna, Roland Vogel. We've taught courses like the Star Bootcamp for Lawyers, teaching product management and design thinking to, to students on how to build classes, how to build products in, a, in an accelerated class. Another class we taught uh, last year was the area of, uh, of a Start Bootcamp for Ethical and Sustainable Development. We took some of the world's most intractable problems like water scarcity, uh, climate change, um, areas of, of, of global justice, and giving justice to those who uh, are underserved, and figuring out some ideas that, that these students, who are law students, business school students, and engineering students could create in their classrooms. And the most recent offering, which we offered last year and we're again offering this year, is this idea of Exponential Innovations AI and Law Bootcamp. Um, it'll be taught by myself, uh, Rowan Vogel, Dan Linna, another leading expert in, in computational law and AI. Um, and we also had Sherrod Goal, who is an AI expert, who also taught in our class. Uh, and we have numerous other individuals. This is, um, we've been very fortunate. It was our first effort. Um, but we had folks from uh, executives from Apple and also from Google, who were our judges, and, uh, and some executives from Stitch Fix and HP and other folks who actually were coaches. So our goal is to bring together industry to come to our classes, folks who are not only lawyers, but also our business leaders, our designers, our actually product leaders, to teach you what it takes to build amazing ideas. And so the fundamental idea behind this is that we think we should not only be teaching law, but the idea of the business fundamentals, of how to actually design products, how to, how to create products through product management, how to pitch products. That's some of the things that you learn in this class. That's the framework. AI, um, Roland actually taught the, the course on AI. Um, he gave a short snippet of it here. But the fundamentals of what you should know about AI and how to apply them. And the last thing is what we know best here at the law school is legal and ethical considerations to make sure we don't hit some of the pitfalls that some of the companies um, like Facebook and others have come across in the areas of privacy or others to make sure we create these so-called sustainable um, innovations that actually are going to be good for society and not things that are unfortunately, in some ways, to the detriment of society. And so this is the framework of the class. It's ambitious because we teach this over the course of a Thursday morning and an accelerated class over the weekend. And we bring together, last year we had 50% uh, law students, 25% engineering students, and another 25% business school students from Stanford who came together for this class. Um, and again, we, we touched, we asked and challenged the students to actually build ideas in the areas of autonomous vehicles, automated professional services, big data, IoT, and blockchain. So they got a chance to learn these and specialize in these areas and get that understanding of how to develop businesses in these areas. So this is just a few example. Um, and we take great pride in also the fact that we want to open the tent to not only people from other um, schools, but also in terms of diversity. We have a very diverse class. Um, we also had, we made sure that it was close to 50% of our students were women, and 50% of our speakers and lecturers were also women. Because we thought it's important to make sure there's, there's, the tent is open to everyone, and everyone is able to innovate equally and have that opportunity. And so we'll be offering this class again um, in winter 2009, 2020. You see the dates up there. Um, and again, this is just one of the uh, humble efforts that we have under the leadership of Roland and Professor Janessa Rith of trying to really disrupt the way that we teach uh, law and, and open the tent to other schools here at Stanford uh, using the platform of Codex. Um, so thank you. All right, thank you, Jay. <laughs> All right, so uh, yeah, so this, uh, this class has been really, I think, eye-opening. I think it's been uh, really a lot of fun, very interactive, and, um, and you, should, you should take it. Uh, it's, uh, again, happening in January, so see you there. Uh, maybe if there's any follow-up questions for Jay while, while Peter is kind of uh, getting ready. Any any questions for Jay on this one? Yes, sir. So this is about the class, but it's more generally about the online project. One thing I'm curious about, I, uh, there was this release of the Black and Male Human Access from Cambridge that I was looking at, and how there's been this emerging difference in the quality of the underlying NLP quality for contract written law versus more public statute or oral law. And I'm curious in the American context, what you think about in the long term, making sure there's not a performance gap Yeah, 
that is a very good question. I'm not, not an expert actually in the area of NLP, so I can't actually answer that specific question. It might be an area we may want to explore in the class as well if you actually want to build a business around that. NLP, uh, I mean, I'm in the field of, uh, of private, and I know our natural language processing, we put significant amounts of investment at SAP in making sure that we can read contracts because we are in the, we built a contract um, module at, at SAP for uh, procurement. And so we have significant amounts of investment to make sure because it's for a profit motive. But I can see that there's a disparity between what we would invest at SAP vis-a-vis -vis what you would be invested for academics to make sure they have access to readily accessible academic texts. So I can see that that being a problem, but I don't know the uh, the state of the the uh, of the of the landscape on that. But thanks for that question. Okay. Hi, um, let's talk about the California RS passport scheme. Yeah, that's kind of hard. Is it? Is it new? It seems like it's pretty. There's been many efforts around this. Yep, 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 yep. California, Arizona. Unfortunately, it was kind of a catastrophe, right? So, like, but I think that's the right conversation to start. Um, I don't know. Sorry. I have a legal tech startup myself, so I, I'm thinking about ways to think about increasing access to justice while keeping lawyers and looking for good things to do in this, like, in the world. That works. Projecting. But it seems that the California Bar Association tried to make a step into that direction, which was like being approached by lawyers saying, like, oh, no, 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 no. Well, lawyers practicing law seems like a terrible idea, which, by the way, I think is a great thing. But uh, if you don't. You know, I, 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 sorry, this Peter, is like. <laughs> Peter and I actually are uh, very familiar with this, and we've been battling this for yep. maybe a decade. A decade. So yeah. I think the, um, the issue is, um, and Peter's company did it, but I was battling with this uh, when I was. Uh, my startup and also as an executive at a company called Rocket Lawyers. And so um, it's, it's difficult because UK has actually allowed for non-lawyers to actually invest in uh, legal companies, which allow for greater sort of innovation in the space of legal technology, whereas it's been very difficult. And um, uh, a funny story, when we actually launched our small little startup of six people, uh, the first press that we got from the California Lawyer Magazine was, um, of all things, an article about um, our terms and conditions. Because they were so obsessed that we were trying to follow the law and making sure that we were, we were complying with uh, the rules on, on non-lawyer sort of engagement or attorney client confidentiality. So I think I, 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 I think this is an area which is a battle that Peter talked about, but I think it's the idea of democratizing access to law and allowing non-lawyers to actually invest in it is a good idea which is allow for greater innovation. And also you Exactly. So, well, Peter Gunst. <laughs> <laughs> All right, so last but not least, uh, Peter Gunst. He, uh, I met him six years ago, seven years ago, when he was a, a student here in our LLM program in Law, Science, and Technology. And he teamed up uh, with uh, one of his classmates um, to start uh, Legal.io. Um, and, uh, and that's, a, I think, pretty uh, groundbreaking new company, but he's also, also been uh, very actively involved in teaching coding to our students and in, um, in uh, building a database that tracks early stage legal tech companies. So Peter is one of the very active uh, contributors to Codex and thank you for coming. And thank you, Roland. So I'm not including the 200 ethics memos that we've read throughout the lifetime of this company in my presentation, but I'm certainly happy to have that conversation offline. Funny fact, there were 900 public comments, 850 were negative in the California uh, 
piece. So the legal market, right, delivering legal services, which is what many of us are here to be trained to do. So fun fact, every year we spend about $900 billion on lawyers globally. Half of that in the US, you have come to the right place. Now, $300 billion of that global amount is spent by large corporations, right? And everything else is, is smaller and down market. And you know, as many of you will know, we're dealing with a very complex, heavily regulated industry, and it's kind of a challenge to innovate in it. And so I was thinking about how I would compress eight years of ramming my head against a wall in a short presentation. So I'm leaving some pieces out. But this is a bit uh, our story. So I was an attorney, I practiced at DLA Piper, was the second attorney hired at SurveyMonkey, um, really passionate about technology and really wondering about how can we make service delivery more efficient using technology. And now, one thing is if you've ever been on the buy side of legal, and no matter whether you're a consumer or a large corporation, you know, fundamentally the buying experience in legal is kind of broken, right? And so, fun fact, 70% of general counsel in large corporation, if you ask them what do you think about their law firm, they're like, meh, not great, right? Uh, Google, lawyers are, you'll get some funny consumer-facing suggestions, right? And across this entire legal supply chain, right, the experience of dealing with us, lawyers, is not great, and it bothered me. And so we decided that we would solve that problem. But what is really the problem, right? You can write books and books about the problems in the legal market. So here's three. The first one is that it's fundamentally a market that lacks transparency, right? If you're on the law talk list, does anyone know a lawyer who does X, Y, Z for the 20,000th time, right? Because we don't have the information to measure quality and reputation, uh, which makes it really hard to make an informed decision. The other thing is if you're a larger organization, to date, you're dealing with 125 law firms, a lot of personal relationships, because I went to school with you, right? And you're my buddy. And, and it's not conducive to efficient you know, procurement of legal service. Another problem is customer service, right? From surprise bills to there's a really large industry conference going on, Clio. They did a fun experiment. They emailed and called a thousand law firms saying, hey, I want to hire you. 40% responded, right? That's literally here, I want to give you money, right? Just one example of you know, customer service, which is not great. So all right, not a small problem, right? And so what we started conceptualizing was this online platform that would bring more transparency to hiring an attorney and that could connect consumers efficiently to trusted legal help. And so we thought that we were going to be a software company. And we had this interesting premise in, in building this infrastructure, and this, that was that there would not be an Uber for legal. Not a singular company that can be the marketplace for legal. Not 10 years from now, not 100 years from now. It's kind of not how we thought it was going to work. So what we did is we went to other organizations where clients and attorneys already came together, in particular bar associations, you know, the ones trying to make Jay's life you know, harder. and, and all you know, organizations that often are not a catalyst for innovation, but what they do do is they match a lot of clients to attorneys, right? And so Iowa State Bar was our first State Bar customer. And what we did for them very simply was we took the attorneys that are part of the Iowa State Bar and we structured all the expertise data. What do you do? What do you say you do? What do you charge, right? Do you offer free consultations? And we basically learned how to express experience data of attorneys in a way that a machine could understand. Now, if you're able to do that, you know, Avo is the example of the big attorney directory that you know, um, is going to make a lasting impact on the market. They were recently acquired by internet brands. But if you're able to structure experience data, a very interesting thing you can do, and this is the Florida State Bar, also using our software, is you can take a request for legal help. For example, I want to sell my house. Then you can use historical data to say, ah, you need a real property lawyer, right? And so we built a machine learning al algorithm that based on a corpus of about half a million consumers describing their legal issue, will basically, it's a multi-label classification issue in AI, assign some labels and say, oh, well, you need a real estate lawyer. What you can do with that, if you have structured the data around attorneys, you can say, well, talk to this attorney who is in your geography, and then you can filter down by language. 
And so we were building this software allowing consumers to connect to attorneys. Now, the other thing we did, because it's fun to you know, get people on the phone, but what happens then, right? And so what we made attorneys do with varying degrees of success, and it's a separate presentation as to how you do this, we made attorneys actually report what happened after they had a phone call with a client. And now bar associations have kind of a stick to do that, because if you lie to the bar, right, you might be disbarred. Um, and that allowed us to track for all these referrals that we were making. Well, does the attorney get hired? How much do they earn? How much time do they spend? And maybe you see this picture coming together of all these pieces of data. That's actually a very interesting data set, because now you can start predicting how, how much something might cost. right? Um, OK, so we did that. We built the software. It's working. At this point, we're connecting about 2,500 clients a week through this infrastructure. So we're pretty proud of that. Um, but then we, we ran into this interesting problem, which is all these bar association customers, they serve you know, the consumer. We have a lot of pro bono matters flowing through our system. But the majority of the legal spend in the market is concentrated in large corporations, which are not at all being served by the bar. They don't call the bar. right? Um, and so at the end of last year, we found ourselves in a situation with 11,000 attorneys in the network. They're in 50 countries, mainly the US. We facilitated about a quarter million referrals. That converts into 25,000 engagements, 10%, pretty much. $35 million in fees earned by the attorneys in the network, and a 9.4% net promoter score. That's clients saying, I would recommend this attorney. Um, look up like average of a law firm, 5.4. Right? And so a really good matching system that understands what are you able to pay, what do you need, that makes it really fast. Right, You're on the phone five minutes later. That kind of makes a difference. Now, the other thing that we had is you know, all this information around which attorneys are good. Right, um, These are all reviews I pulled that came in today. And, and this, you know, attorneys are mortally afraid of reviews. And bar associations using our platform collect them, but they don't publicly show them. But we basically you know, rate attorneys on a series of vectors, right? which then allows us to inform the matching algorithm. The other thing that has happened as a result of